So here we have, uh, as you can see on the screen, uh, they should have listened to the prophets. Now the Bible says, surely the Lord God would do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. Surely the Lord God would do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. Now this is so important because remember, it is it is crucial that we believe the word of God and his prophets. The majority of the word of God comes through his prophets, his messengers, his prophets. And so God tells us in the scripture that surely the Lord God would do nothing, but he reveals his secret unto his servants, the prophets, and thus his prophets then relay that message to us. In fact, it's so important that God put in the book of Revelation that one of the identifying marks of the final church would be the spirit of prophecy, or the testimony of Jesus Christ, which is the spirit of prophecy. That is how important it is. That's how important it would be at the end of at the end of time that God would that God would put it through His prophet in the book of John and the book of Revelation to tell us that if you want to know whether or not you are following the right way with the right congregation, for lack of a better term, the right movement, one of the ways to know is that you're going to have the gift of prophecy there. And so we have here. Now, let's go back up for a minute, and it's a, a very popular text that a lot of people quote, but it's interesting when we look back at it. It says, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall ye be established. Believe his prophets, so shall ye prosper. So when you go back and you look at what brought Jehoshaphat to this point, his kingdom was being threatened by Moabites and Ammonites, and all these, all these kingdoms were coming up against him. And he called for a big, you know, prayer fast, if you will, or, and a fasting. and said, listen, we are about to be overcome, but we need to trust in God. And in his speech to the people, he said, he said hear me, O Judah, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. He says, believe in the Lord your God, so shall you be established. Believe his prophets, so shall you prosper. But the question becomes, how, before, before, before this happened in Second Chronicles 20 and 20, there's the reason that he got to this point. Uh, he had a better understanding of this point for a very specific reason. And if we back up, we will see and we will understand why Jehoshaphat made this proclamation at the time. In Second Chronicles 18, we read Ahab, it's a familiar story, you're familiar with it, and Ahab, king of Israel, said in Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, wilt thou go with me to Ramoth Gilead? Now, this is Jehoshaphat now. This is before he made, this is early in Chronicles, before he made that popular quote that we hear quoted all the time. Ahab, king of Israel, said unto Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, Will thou go with me to Ramoth Gilead? And he answered him, I am as thou art, and my people as thy people, and we will be with thee in the war. Now, the backdrop, you know, again, Israel had been split uh, because of their apostasy, where you had the northern kingdom that became Israel, and you had Judah and Benjamin with the southern kingdom. And so now because they were split, so now uh, Ahab, who is the king of Israel, who had, who, who had led the, the, the northern kingdom into uh, uh, apostasy, deep, deep apostasy, here he wanted, he wanted, he wanted the, the righteous king Jehoshaphat to league up with him. And so Jehoshaphat said, yeah, you know, we, you know we, even though we, we, we have some differences, we're still part of the same family, if you will, spiritual family and literal family too. And he answered him, he said, I, he said, I am as thou art, and my people as thy people, and we will be with thee in the war. Now, and the Bible says, then Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, but before we do this, we need, to, we need to pray and inquire. We need to ask God about this before we go to war here. We need, we need to stop and ask God. Therefore, the king of Israel, who was Ahab, gathered together prophets, 400 men, and said unto them, Shall we go to Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall I forbear? And they said, Go up, for God will deliver it into the king's hand. Verses 4 and 5 of Second Chronicles 18. Now, we need to stop here for a minute. You notice, it didn't say that, that, that the king of Israel gathered the prophets of the Lord together. It says he, he gathered prophets, 400 men, and said unto them, Shall we go up to Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall I forbear? And they said, Go up, for God will deliver it into the king's hand. So then we read in verse 6, But Jehoshaphat said, No, 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 no. Wait, wait a minute. He said, Is there not here a prophet of the Lord besides? So think about what this. Here was Ahab, which they were considered Israelites. They had gone so far in apostasy in the northern kingdom that when he was asked about inquiring of the Lord, he brought in 450 prophets, the prophets of Baal. The, the thing about how far he had gone, 
And so, but Jehoshaphat said, wait, 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 hold, hold on. Is there not here a prophet of the Lord beside that we might inquire of him? He says, you know, so that means that tells us that he kind of knew, you know, yeah, he, he's my, my brother, but he's into some apostasy. So, as we, we know the story, uh, let, but let's back up for a minute. Why would you have these two men who belong to the kingdom of Israel, even though the kingdom had been split, one being having a totally different mindset than the other one? This is what Second Chronicles 17 says about Jehoshaphat. And the Lord was with Jehoshaphat, because he walked in the first ways of his father David, and sought not unto Balaam, but sought to the Lord God of his father, and walked in his commandments, and not after the doings of Israel. So you notice, the Bible says specifically, talking about Jehoshaphat, talking about his character, that he did not follow the doings or the teachings of the northern kingdom of Israel, because they had gone and bought into apostasy. And, he says, and his heart was lifted up in the ways of the Lord. Moreover, he took away the high places and the groves out of Judah. He was trying to drive out the apostasy that was also had been set up in the, in the southern kingdom of Judah. And so here we can see one reason when we look at the character of the two men, why Ahab would talk about the, bringing these 450 prophets of Baal, and, but, and you look at uh, Jehoshaphat, he's like, no, 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 we need to ask, about the, we need to ask of the Lord. So we, then the Bible pulls back and helps us to understand why one man would go one way and seek one group of prophets, and why another man would go another way and seek the prophet of the Lord. And because, because Jeho Jehoshaphat, we're told, walked in the ways of his father David, he sought not to Balaam, but he sought to the Lord God of his father, and he walked in his commandments, and not after the doings of Israel. And so, and, and so, and his heart was lifted up in the ways of the Lord. And the king of Israel said in Jehoshaphat, okay, he says, yep, and we know the story. He said, there is one man by whom we may inquire of the Lord. So you notice, he specifically said, okay, there's one guy. He says, but I hate him. I hate him. Why does he hate him? For he never prophesied good unto me, but always evil. This guy always got something negative to say about me when it comes to prophecy. The same is Micaiah. Now, if you read the scripture, we don't have time to go into all the details there, but you go back and you read it. It says that they sent a messenger to Micaiah. And when they got it, they told Micaiah to come and to say, listen, and the message says, listen, all the prophets are saying one thing, all the prophets are saying one thing, and we just need you to go along with the agenda. That is what we need you to do. Just go along. Everybody's prophesying good with the king, and, and, and just go along with the, with the agenda. Now, think about that. The agendas are not always bad. Sometimes we hear agenda, agendas in, in the context of them being bad. Agendas are not always bad. We can have God's agenda. We can have our own agenda. Or we can have saved agenda or whatever. But agendas in and of themselves are not always bad. In fact, our agenda is the three angels' message and the loud cry. That's God's agenda that he's given us. So the agenda itself, but he was trying to get, he was trying to get Micaiah, a prophet of the Lord, to go along with the agenda of the prophets of Baal and of an apostate king. And it says, and, and while he was gone, we read that all the prophets prophesied, saying, Go up to Ramah Gilead and prosper, for the Lord should deliver it into the hand of the king. And now when Micaiah got there, it says, And when he was come to the king, the king said unto him, Micaiah, should we go to Ramah Gilead to battle, or shall I forbear? Now, stop and listen to this. It's very important, because this goes to what the, the, the title is. They should have listened to the prophets. Listen to this. He says, tell me, you know, should I go up or should I forbear? And he said, now, Micaiah was being kind of facetious here. He said, oh, yeah, go up. Go up and prosper. And they should be delivered to your hand. Go ahead. That's what your prophets are telling you, right? Go ahead and do it. That's what your prophets are telling you. Go ahead and go and do what they say. And, but if you could tell it was facetious because the king said to him, no, no, no. He said, how many times shall I adjure thee that thou say nothing but truth to me in the name of the Lord. So now he's okay, speak to me in the name of the Lord. So now he's required, you no, know, he's okay, I'm, I'm going to tell you straight up now. He says, I did see all Israel scattered. Now, now I want to stop here, look at this. He is going to tell the king several times that if you go out there today, you're going to die. Now think about this, his reception or rejection of the message from the prophet depended on him dying or living that day. He should have listened to the prophets. 
This one, I tell you, listen how many times he told him he was going to die. He said, then he said, I did, I did see all Israel scattered upon the mountains as sheep. They have, they have no shepherd. And the Lord says, these have no master. Let them return, therefore, every man to his house in peace. He tells them, listen, if you go out, he says, I saw all these sheep of Israel scattered. You are the king. You are the master of them. And the Lord said, they have no master. In other words, if you go out there, you're going to be killed. And the king of Israel understood because he said to Jehoshaphat, did I not tell thee that he would not prophesy good unto me, but evil? So think about it. He says, he's not prophesying, prophesying good unto me. So what do you want him to lie to, it, to you? You want him to lie to you and tell you something that's true that is not? And so then, Micaiah said, I'm not done yet. Again, he said, therefore, he says, hear the word of the Lord. So the prophet speaks the word of the Lord. A true prophet speaks the word of the Lord, and he should have listened to the words of the prophet. He says, I saw the Lord sitting upon his throne, and all the host of heaven standing on his right hand and on his left. Now, if you catch that, it's very important to catch this. When we, this is a judgment scene. Remember, remember in, 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 in Daniel, you see a similar scene when it was talking about the commencement of the judgment. So you see a similar, a similar uh, 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 scene here. He said, therefore, hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting upon his throne and all the hosts of heaven standing on his right hand on his left. And the Lord said, who shall entice Ahab, king of Israel, that he may go up and follow Ramoth Gilead? Now stop right there. That's the second time he told him. That's the second time he told him, if you go out, you're going to be killed. Because now he said, listen, I saw, this is what I saw, and I heard the word of the Lord said, who is going to go up and fall and, 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 and may uh, uh, and ensure that, 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 that uh, Ahab falls at Ramathiliad? Then there came out a spirit and just stood before the Lord and said, I will entice him. And, and the scripture says, and he said, I will go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. It's, ama it's, ama it's amazing how one lying spirit, just one, can affect the prophecy in the message of 450 people. One lying spirit. And the Lord said, Thou shalt entice him, and thou shalt also prevail. He just told him again. The third time, when he said, Thou shalt prevail, to prevail to do what? To cause him to fall. So he just told him a third time, If you go out in, in, in the country of this prophecy, you're going to be killed. And do even so. Again, he told him, again. Now, therefore, behold, the Lord Put a lying spirit in the mouth of these thy prophets, and the Lord has spoken evil against you. Again, he tells them, the Lord has spoken evil against you. He tells them, uh, 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 they're going to prevail against you. He tells them, if you go out, they're, gonna, they're not going to have a king. Just like four times he told them already. Then the king of Israel said, Take ye Micaiah, and carry him back to Ammon, the governor of the city, and to Joash, the king's son, and say, Thus says the king, Put this fellow in the prison, and feed him with bread reflection and with water reflection until I return in peace. So he just told you that he didn't believe anything the prophet said. He just told him at least four times in different ways that you go out today, you're going to be killed, and he did not believe the prophet. Brothers and sisters, they should have listened to the prophets. He says, I, I, he says I'm not listening. I'm coming back in peace. I don't care what you say. I don't care what God says. I'm coming back in peace. And so what did the prophet say? And Micaiah said, you know, you know, Micaiah didn't back down. He didn't back down because, remember, he didn't back down before when he went, when they told him, oh, you know, go along with the program. He said, I'm going to tell you what the Lord told me to tell you. That's what he said. He says, when I go, I'm not going along with the agenda that's contrary to God's agenda. I'm going to tell you what the Lord told me to tell you. And so now Micaiah told the king, if thou certainly return in peace, then hath not the Lord spoken by me. And he said, hearken all ye people. In other words, listen all ye people. Listen to the prophets. And says, Micaiah says, listen, if you come back in peace, I am not a true prophet. If you come back in peace, I am not a true prophet. You are going out there today, and you are going to die if you go out there. And, and a certain man, this is verses 33 and 34, we've been in Second Chronicles 18. And a certain man drew a bow at a venture and smote the king of Israel between the joints of the harness. Therefore he said to his chariot man, turn thine hand that thou mayest carry me out of the host for I am wounded and the battle increased that day how be it the king of Israel stayed himself up in his chariot against the Syrians until the even and then what does it say and about the time of the sun going down he died you should have listened to the prophet Ellen White says in the book Prophets and Kings page 196 the words of the prophet 
should have been enough to show the kings that their project was not favored by heaven. Let's stop right there for a minute. She says, the, the prophet says, the word of the prophet should have been enough. Is the, are the words of the prophet enough for us? Are the words of the prophet enough for us? They should be because if not, it would be written of us. He should have listened to the prophets. We don't want it written of us. He should have listened to the prophets. She should listen to the prophets. She said the words of the prophet should have been enough to show the kings that their project was not favored by heaven. Think about that. Even our project, even when we sit down and get ready to do something, we have to ask, Lord, is it in harmony with what you told us to do? If it, is it in harmony with the prophets from the Bible? Is it in harmony with the, with the spirit of prophecy? If not, like, like, like his, his, his project was not favored of heaven, and she said the words, how do we know? You, you measure it by the word of the prophet. She said the words of the prophet should have been enough to show the kings that their project was not favored by heaven. But neither ruler felt inclined to heed the warning. Ahab had marked out his course, and he was determined to follow it. And even Jehoshaphat, the righteous king, had given his word of honor. He says, we will be with thee in war. And after making such a promise, he was reluctant to withdraw his forces. That's Proverbs and Kings, page 196. So remember that. They should have listened to the prophet. Had Ahab listened to the prophet, he would have been alive. He would not have died that day. He made that day his last day on earth because of his disobedience. And Jehoshaphat, the righteous king, you read the story, he almost made it his last day on earth because of his disobedience. They should have listened to the prophets. Second Chronicles 19, verses 1 through 3, we read, And Jehoshaphat, the righteous king, the king of Judah, because remember, he was the king of the, of the southern kingdom, as it, and, 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 and Ahab was the king of the apostate northern kingdom, Israel. And Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, returned to his house in peace to Jerusalem. Huh. Now, he, the righteous king returned in peace, and the wicked king who claimed he was returning in peace ended up dying. And Jehu, the son of Hanani, the seer, or prophet, went out to meet him. He went out to meet Jehoshaphat and said to King Jehoshaphat, Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Think about that. If you do not believe in the prophet, the word of prophets, you hate God. This is what he told him. He said, should thou help the ungodly? Not only that, he said, they are ungodly. Ahab had done what he had always done. When you read his history in the Bible, he always had a, pro pro a problem with the prophet. He had a problem, he had a problem with Micaiah. He had a problem with, 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 with Elijah. He, had, he always had a problem with them. Why did he always have a problem with the prophet? Because he had trained his mind and conditioned his mind to not listen to the prophet. Jehoshaphat, on the other hand, although he made a mistake here, and he went along because there was his, his fellow brother in Christ, quote, he went along with them. They were all members of Israel. He went along with them. He says, but the prophet came out, and he says, shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Think about that. He says, why are you linking up with those who hate the Lord? He says, therefore is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. Nevertheless, there are good things found in thee, in that thou hast taken away the groves out of the land. That's where he removed the elements of apostasy. Out of, out of Judah, and has prepared thine heart to seek God. Two kings, one event, one righteous, one wicked. They both should have listened to the prophet that day. And so as a result, now, when, 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 when Jehoshaphat makes this quote, this, this Second Chronicles 20, 20, when he said, remember, because the Lord says, wrath is upon you, and not long after that, he had all his kingdoms, all these kingdoms, Surrounded, surrounded Judah, and, and they're going to put him to death, but he prayed to the Lord. And remember when he learned, when he went, after he experienced what he experienced, he says, O oh, Judah, and ye have of Jerusalem, believe in the Lord your God, so shall ye be established. Believe his prophets, so shall ye prosper. Remember, he had almost cost him his life by not listening to the prophet. He, had, he was out there, and, and his ally, King, King, King Ahab, had, had, had actually, it had cost him his life. So now when this man makes his, makes his proclamation, when he says, believe in the Lord your God, so shall you be established, believe in power, so shall you prosper, he's saying it because he knows it to be true from personal experience. Will it be written of us? We should listen to the prophets. Now, if you go over to 2 Kings 1, 1 through 3, we have another example. After Ahab died, 
his son Ahaziah came to power. And the Bible says, and Ahaziah fell down through a lattice in his upper chamber that was in Samaria, and he was sick. And he sent messengers and said unto them, Go inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, whether I should recover victory. Now stop right there for a moment. You are an Israelite. You have the promise of the Lord in Israel. Even though, they, even though the kingdom as a whole was apostate, you still have righteous people there. You still had the prophet Elijah there, who was sent there, who was there, sent there, sent a message of a proof and rebuke to them. Because Ahab and Jezebel had taken the kingdom so far into apostasy, they were almost unrecognizable from being the, the people of God. And so they were going so far that his son now, he falls down, he gets sick, and what does he do? Because of the apostasy of their household, what happened? Instead of asking inquiring of the Lord, he's gone, they've gone so far that he inquired of Beelzebub, the, of Erkon, the god of Erkon, whether or not he would recover from the disease. But the angel of the Lord said to, to, to Elijah the Tishbite, Arise, go up to meet the messengers of the king of Samaria, and say to them, Is it not because there's not a god in Israel that you go to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Erkon? That was, the, that, was, that was like spitting in the face of God. He said, Now therefore, thus saith the Lord, Thou shalt not come down from that bed on which thou art going up, but thou shalt surely die. Think about that. Now Elijah the prophet comes in and says, you know what? Because you've done this, you should surely die. Do we believe the prophet? Now, and Elijah departed. And when the messengers turned back unto him, and he said unto them, Why are ye now turned back? And they said unto him, There came a man up to meet us and said unto us, Go, turn again unto the king that sent you, and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, is it not because there is not a God in Israel that thou sent it to inquire of Baal, Baal, the, the, above, the God of Erkon? Therefore thou shalt not come down from that bed on which thou art going up, but shalt surely die. And so he said, he said, what manner of man was he which came up to meet you and told you these words? And they answered him and said, he was a hairy man and girt with a girt of leather about his loins. And know what he said? He said, it is Elijah the Tishbite. So he knew of the true prophet. And yet, he, although he knew of the true prophet, what did he do? He didn't inquire the true prophet. He asked of a apostate, of a, of a pagan prophet, the prophet, the God of Ephraim, the Palestinian deity. So how is it that an Israelite, he had, the, he had the prophet right there in his midst, and instead of following that prophet, he's so far gone that he should, that it cost him his life. He's so far gone that he, he inquired of a pagan deity. But guess what? And the angel of the Lord said to Elijah, now let me back up for a minute. What did he do? He sent, uh, he sent 50 captains to get Elijah. And they said, oh, man of God, come out. And Elijah said, if I be a man of God, let fire come down to heaven and consume you. Boom. Kill 50 of them. He said, 50 more to him. The same thing happened. And then the third one came. He said, he came with great respect to the prophet. And he said, okay, you know, oh, man of God. And the Lord said, and the angel of the Lord said to Elijah, 2 Kings 1, verse 15 and 16, go down with him. Be not afraid of him. And he arose and went down with him into the king. And he said to him, Thus saith the Lord, For as much as thou hast sent messengers to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Erkon, is it not because there is no god in Israel to inquire of his word? Therefore thou shalt not come down off that bed on that which thou art gone up, but thou shalt surely die. Now think about this. He is going to die. Why is he going to die? Because he didn't listen to the prophet. He said, Well, what do you mean? Why, how did he listen to the prophet? Listen what Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 12, 30 says. Now remember, it's not like he didn't know who Elijah was. He said, he said, tell me what the man looked like. And, they, and when they gave him the scripture, he said, oh, that's Elijah the prophet. That's Elijah the Tishbite. So he was familiar with Elijah because remember, Elijah, in, during, his, during his father's life, Elijah had brought the, the, under the, by the word of Elijah, through the power of God, the drop had been brought on the whole area, on the whole kingdom. So he knew who Elijah was. He didn't know who Elijah was, but, but he did not listen to the prophet. Therefore, he was going to die. How did he listen to the prophet? They were Israelites. They had, they, had, they had the Bible. They had the law uh, uh, of them. They knew what the God of Israel required. Remember, this is what God has said in Deuteronomy 12, 30. Take heed to thyself that thou be not snared by following them. And he was talking about the gods of the kingdom, of the kingdom that, he, that, that was going to be removed. He said, he said, take heed to thyself that thou be not snared by following them after that they be destroyed from before thee. And that thou inquired not after their God, saying, how did these nations serve their gods? Even so will I do likewise. So by inquiring of this God, he's going to, have to, he's going to basically have to serve him. He's showing his allegiance and his service of that God. And God had told them, the prophet, 
Moses. Moses had a gift of prophecy, and, 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 and Moses had said, Take heed to thyself that thou be not snared by following them after they be destroyed from before thee. Talking about the pagan kingdom that they were going to be taking their land. And that thou inquire not after their gods, saying, How did these nations serve their gods? Even so will I do likewise. So he's inquiring to seek of, of the god of Urkon, and as a result, it cost him his life because he didn't listen to the prophet. He should have listened to the prophet. Now, there is a king who did listen to the prophet. In those days, was Hezekiah, in the same book, Second Kings, in those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. And the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, came to him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Now, did he believe this? Did he listen to the prophet? Of course, because listen to what he did. Then he turned his face to the wall and prayed unto the Lord, saying, I beseech thee, O Lord, remember now how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart and have done that which is good in thy sight. And the Bible says, Hezekiah wept sore, the 2 Kings 20, verses 1 through 3. So Hezekiah believed the prophet. He was a righteous king. Don't, believe, don't think that we're righteous if we don't believe the prophet. Because the prophets speak on behalf of the Lord, true prophets. Don't say that we're righteous if we don't believe the prophets, because you don't have any evidence anywhere in the scripture that says that. He says, now Hezekiah, Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord, saying, I beseech you, Lord, remember, now have I, I walk before thee in truth. And the thing, look at how merciful God is. This is how merciful God is. Before the prophet, the prophet walked in and told him that, and before the prophet could get totally out, before the prophet could leave good, it says, and it came to pass, before Isaiah was gone out into the middle court, that the word of the Lord came to him saying, wait, 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 stop. Wait, stop, stop. Go back. And tell Hezekiah, the captain of my people, thus saith the Lord, the God of David, thy father, I have heard thy prayer. I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will heal thee on the third day, and thou shalt go up unto the house of the Lord. Now think about it. Ahab, when he was told by the prophet, don't do something, he ignored the prophet, said, I'm going to do what I want to do anyway, and it cost him his life. Hezekiah, who was going to die, who was supposed to die, it was the reverse. He listened to the prophet and gained 15 years on his life. And God was so merciful that before the prophet could get out of the temple good, he said, go back and tell him I'm going to give him 15 more years. He's not going to die. He's going to live. That's the God that we serve. That's the God that we serve. And so he said, and I will add, until that day, 15 years, and Isaiah said, now, this, now think about this. He says, take a lump of figs. And they took it and laid it on the boil, and he recovered. Now, he had a terminal illness, a terminal illness, and because he believed the prophet, he says, take a lump of figs and lay it on the boil, and he recovered. Now, it's interesting, when, when, when the pandemic broke out, how many people, even Adventists, who didn't even give God's way a chance. Remember when it first broke out, they said, oh, we don't know. We don't have anything to, we don't know anything to do. We don't have anything. All you can do is social distance and stay in the house. That's, we, don't know, we don't have anything to stop this. Did we listen to the prophets? Did we really believe, do we really believe that a lump of figs could cure a terminal illness with the blessing of God? Think about that. I saw so many of our brothers and sisters who've been in the church for so long, for years. I, I know many people who've heard us talk about the health message. They've heard us talk about what could be done, and people were terrified, terrified. You don't believe that God doesn't understand that corona was coming? Have not we talked about this is why he gave the health message? But the question is, do we really, do we really believe the prophet? Do we really believe it? Look what they said. They said, take a lump of figs. Now, this is at the word of prophet. We have a prophet who told us what to do. The prophet told us what to do. Do we really believe the prophet? Will it be written of us that they should have listened to the prophet? Will it be written of us that they should have listened to the prophet? Listen, we should have listened to the prophet. I've never seen so many people terrified. Have not we been told in the writings how to boost our immune system, how to live? How to live in such a way that we don't become more we don't become more susceptible because we have comorbidities that make us more susceptible to these diseases. You know why we were so terrified? 
because we we thought I am tired of hearing stuff about Ellen White and health. That's why we were terrified. You know why? I'm tired of hearing this. I'm tired of another another health, another talk about drinking water and this and that. Oh, another seminar on health. I'm tired. I don't want to hear that. And as a result, we end up developing comorbidities over years. And so now, when this hits, we are terrified because we didn't listen to the prophet. Who really believes that something so simple, when we listen to the prophet, could cure a terminal illness? Woe to the inhabitants of the earth. We need to believe. Why do we need to believe? If we don't believe, it would be written of us. They should listen to the prophets. Listen to this. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth. And of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. Do we believe that? Do we believe the prophet John Revelation? Or will it be written of us we should listen to the prophets? Because if we don't believe this, we will make decisions like Ahab and like Ahaziah and not like Hezekiah. Do we believe this? Will it be written of us that we should have listened to the prophets? He says, woe to the inhabitants of the earth. We're living at the end. How, I mean, think about it. We see right now, God allowed us to see how many of us really don't have faith in what he said. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short Do we believe he has but a little short time? Do we believe that? Do we really, really, really believe that? It will be made plain sooner than we think, if we really believe that. Listen to what the prophet of the Lord, do we, do, we, do we really believe the prophet? People say, well, if I would have been back there, I would have believed what Micaiah said. If I would have believed what Isaiah said. I would have believed what we have opportunity to believe. We have opportunity to show that we would have believed the prophet right now. Listen, the last great day is right upon us, said the prophet of the Lord. Let all consider that Satan is now striving for the mastery over souls. He is playing the game of life for your souls. Now let's personalize it. We say, oh, well, the church this and the church. Okay, but what about your soul? What about my soul? She said, the prophet of the Lord tells us the same way that message was personal. It was a personal message that day to Ahab. He says, if you go out, you will not come back alive. It was a personal me message to Ahaziah when he says, you're not coming down from that bed because you did not listen to the prophet. Now, here we have a personal message to us. The last great day is right upon us. Let all consider that Satan is now striving for the mastery over his soul. That means my soul. That means more your soul. He says he is playing the game of life for your soul. Do we believe that? That's from Testimony on Sexual Behavior, Your Doctrine and Divorce, page 90. Do we believe that? Will it be written of us? We should have listened to the prophets. The very last deception of Satan. First elected message, page 48. The very last deception of Satan. Now think about this. It was so important that the prophet of the Lord thought it was so, the Lord thought it was so important to tell, to tell his prophet that the very last deception of Satan will be to make of none effect the testimony of the Spirit of God. That's the Spirit of the prophecy, the message of the prophet. He says, where there is no vision, the people perish, Proverbs 29, 18. Satan will work ingeniously in different ways and through different agencies to unsettle the confidence of God's remnant people in the true testimony. There will be a hatred kindled against the testimonies, which is satanic. It's the same hatred of the testimonies that move Ahab to, to, want to, 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 to hate Elijah, to hate Micaiah. He says, I hate him, for he always testified evil toward me. He didn't say, I dislike him. He didn't say, hey, yo, I, I know. He said, no, I hate him. He hated the prophet. And then the prophet tells us there will be a hatred kindled against the testimonies, the spirit of prophecy, which is satanic, which we're already saying. Question, will it be written of us that we should have listened to the prophets? The working of Satan, first selected message, page 48. The working of Satan will be to unsettle the faith of the churches in them. Talking about the testimonies. For this reason, why is he doing it? He's going to tell us. Satan cannot have so clear track to bring in his deceptions and bind up souls in his delusions if the warnings and reproofs and counsel of the Spirit of God are heeded. So here's why he hates it. He hates it the same way he did 
to lead Ahab to his death. He said, you know what? I, 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 I'm going to lead you to your death in an unsafe condition. That's what he wants to do. He wants to cause us to be lost in an unsafe condition because we did not receive the message of the Lord from his prophets. And he says, he, she says he wants to unsettle the faith of the churches in them. He wants to unsettle the faith of all, of all our churches in them. He says, for this reason, he cannot have so clear a trike to bring in his deception and bind up souls in his delusions. In other words, it helps us keep from being deceived and deluded. If the warning and reproof and counsel the Spirit of God are heeded. The enemy's agents. Let me go back. That was from First Lady Message, page 48. And in Special Testimony Series B, number 2, page 11, says the enemy's agents are working unceasingly to prevail against the truth. Where are the faithful guardians of the Lord's flocks? Where are his watchmen? Are they standing on the high tower giving the, the dangerous signal? Or are they allowing the peril to pass unheeded? If we're allowing it to pass unheeded, that's because we don't believe the words of the prophets. Will it be written of us? Will it be written of you? Will it be written of me that they should have listened to the prophets? First Lady Messages, page 200 and page 197. In her day, <clears throat> a, a crisis hit the church. Dr. Kellogg, who got caught up in spiritualism, a form of spiritualism, and he wrote this book called Living Temple, and it was, sat it was satanic, all type of, it, was, it, was, it, it appeared to have spirit of prophecy quotes and Bible quotes, and it appeared to be something that, were, that was legitimate. But actually, it was a satanic document. And she says, listen, in the book Living Temple, there's presented the alpha of deadly heresies. The omega will follow and will be received by those who are not willing to heed the warning God has given. Given how? Through the prophet. Will it be written of us that we should have listened to the prophets? Be not deceived. Many will depart from the faith, giving heed to what? To seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Why? Because they will receive not the love of the truth given, to God through, given by God through his prophets. We have now before us, she wrote, in that day, the alpha of this danger, the omega, the alpha means the beginning, the omega means the end. The omega will be of a most startling nature, but do we believe the prophets? She told us that the alpha of these deceptions would be within the book Living Temple. But the omega will be of a most startling, when you something startling, I mean, we will see things that we would never thought would happen, and we would be startled, shocked, amazed, discombobulated. Will it be written of you and I that we didn't believe the prophet about the omega will be of a most startling nature? Special Testimony, Series B, number 7, pages 39 and 40. The enemy of the soul, the prophet tells us. And remember, think about this. Make this personal. The same, as I said before, the same way when Micaiah came and told Ahab, and, 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 and the prophet, specifically Ahab, he says, you, your reception or rejection of this message from God is going to determine whether you live or whether you die. And for us, our reception or rejection of the words of the prophet is going to ultimately determine whether we live or whether we die, whether we have eternal life or eternal death. The enemy of souls, we read, has sought to bring in the supposition that a great reformation was to take place among Seventh-day Adventists and that this reformation will consist in giving up the doctrine, we stand as the pillars of our faith. Do we believe that? Do we believe what the prophet said? She says, and engaging in a process of reorganization. She says, the enemy of souls, she didn't say that, would think about bringing it in. She says, the enemy of souls has sought to bring in the supposition that a great reformation was to take place amongst Baptists. Did they say Baptists? No. Amongst Pentecostals? No, that's not what it says. It says amongst Seventh-day Adventists, and that this reformation would consist, now remember, there's a counterfeit. There's a true reformation, reviving reformation, and there's a counterfeit reviving reformation. It says that this reformation, this, she's talking about, that she's warning us against the counterfeit. That she's warning us against the counterfeit, but will we listen? Will it be written of us that we should listen to the prophet? 
And this reformation will consist in giving up the doctrine we stand at the pillars of our faith and engaging in a process of reorganization where this reformation to take place. And now the prophet pulls back the veil and says, if you allow this reformation to take place, here's what's going to happen. What will be your result? The principal truth that God and his wisdom has given to the remnant church would be discarded. The same way she warned Ahab, she warned, she warned him and said, if you go out, this is what's going to happen. The same way he warned God, warned Ahab rather. The same way here we were receiving the same God sending a, a, a message through one of his prophets. She said, the principal truth that God and his wisdom has given to the remnant church would be discarded. The foundations. What would happen is our religion would be changed. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The fundamental principles that have sustained the work in her day for the last 50 years would be accounted as error. Oh, we had it all wrong all along. You know what? We had it all wrong all along. A new organization would be established. Books of a new order would be written and be found in our stores. A system of intellectual philosophy would be introduced. A system. So this is not just one doctrine here or there. That's a system. She said a system of intellectual philosophy would be introduced. Do we believe the prophet? Or would we be like Ahab? Even though after, 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 after Ahab had been warned, that if you got three or four times, what did he say? I'm coming back in peace. The man said, you're not coming back in peace. He said, no, I'm coming back in peace. Have we conditioned and trained our mind to doubt the prophet of the Lord? She tells us, if we accept this, this is what's going to happen. A new organization will be established. A book of a new order, a book of a new order will be written. A system of intellectual philosophy would be introduced. Then she goes on to tell us the founders of this system were going to the city and do a wonderful work. It's oh, you know what? We have a counterfeit. We have a counterfeit uh, 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 gospel going on. Not only we have a whole new system set up, and now we're going to go and evangelize based upon this system instead of the system that the Lord has given us, the truth that the Lord has given us, the foundational principles that God has given us. We're going to throw that to the side. That was that was going to be accounted as error. That was error. We were mistaken. We've been you no. Know we've been wrong. All, we've been wrong. We've been wrong all along. We, you know, we're going to go into this, we find the system, we'll go into the cities and do a wonderful work. We're going to do, we're going to go, we're going to, you know, we're going to do, we're going to do works of love, we're going to hand out this, we're going to hand out that, we're going to do, we're going to be, you know, we're going to, we're going to work after the poor. We're going to do all this, but it's a false system. It's a counterfeit system. In this system, they will go to the cities and do a, quote, wonderful work, but they will disregard the law and the requirements of the Lord. So the Sabbath, of course, will be lightly regarded, and also the God who created it. Nothing would be allowed to stand in the way of the new movement. Now, you think about it. The Seventh-day Adventist movement, we've been called a movement. You know, we saw the Seventh-day Adventist church, we call it a movement. But now the prophet tells us that this a new movement, if we, if we don't know how people accuse you, said a new movement, which would be the omega of apostasy, which started back with the Alpha. It's where a new movement would be, uh, nothing would be allowed to stand in the way of the new movement, the counterfeit movement. But do we believe the prophet? Do we believe? Or will it be written of us? We should have listened to the prophet. Now, give an example. We've been warned all through our life. I've spoken about this a couple of times, that there's a conspiracy between the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet. The dragon being Satan in his most confrontational form. Sometimes it's manifesting Satanism and all these different things. The beast is the first beast of Revelation 13, the papacy. Yeah, that's still the first beast. I know we uh, hear and know the, uh, the, the influence of the new movement that's been you know that's not really maybe maybe we're mistaken maybe maybe the papacy is not the first beast maybe it's somebody else well maybe maybe no the prophet says it is the papacy period the second beast the beast of the lamb like horns are the fallen protestants they call themselves evangelicals now yeah they call themselves evangelicals now they're supposed to link up that's what we believe, right? That's what the prophet told us, right? Do we still believe it? Or will it be written of us that we should have listened to the prophet? Listen to this. This man you see on the screen there, if those who are looking on the computer, a name by name, a man by the name of Carl Rayners. Now, at the Second Vatican Council, that's when the papacy, when they stopped calling the Protestant churches uh, and, and, and the Protestants her heretics. They said, you know what? This is not working. You know, this is not, we find a way to work with it. We're not going to call them heretics anymore. We're not going to change. We're not going to call them heretics anymore. We're going to just call them our separated brethren. They're separated brethren. But we shouldn't get caught by that. You know why? Because we've been told by the prophet. We've been told by John in Revelation. 
We've been told by the great controversy. We've been told what to look out for. The only question that remains is, will it be written of us that we should listen to the prophet? Look at this. This man, Carl Rayner's theology, influenced the Second Vatican Council. Again, his guy, he said, you know what? We, he, 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 we need to stop calling heretics. We're not, we need to stop using this language because this is not going to get anybody. We need to say they're going to be our separated brethren. And it says that Carl Rayner's theology influenced the Second Vatican Council and was, ground, and was groundbreaking for the development of what is generally seen as the modern understanding of, of, of Catholicism. A new, kinder, softer Catholicism on its surface. But if you read the prophet, she says she is unchanged. But do you believe the prophet? Listen to what he says. He says, now this, again, this is what's generally accepted as, remember, this is what's generally accepted as a modern understanding of Catholicism. He said, listen, we need to change. If we're going to complete this, 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 this concept of, uh, uh, of this conspiracy, we need to find a way to kind of, you know, uh, work this out. So what did they come up with? He says, unity of the churches is, actual, is an actual possibility. It was eight theses of the final attack. And this is the eight theses, I call them, eight theses of the final attack. He says, because Protestants may be skeptical about union with Rome, he says, do not introduce the idea to the public at first. Quietly court the thought leaders in the church that you wish to influence. So if we said, listen now, if we read the great controversy, if we read the writings of the prophet, we would not be shocked and say, oh, this can't be true. This is, this is a ridiculous conspiracy theory. Yeah, it is a conspiracy theory. The beast, the dragon, the false prophet. The only problem is not a theory. So don't be a coincidence theorist. Believe, what the, believe the Lord. <clears throat> be, be, believe God. So you, so should you be established. Believe his prophets. So should you prosper. Remember, Jehoshaphat made that statement <clears throat> after almost losing his life and disobeying the prophet. Secondly, on the basis of their theological expertise, these church leaders can decide in favor of church unity. So first, don't, he says, don't go out to the public. Go in and, and court the thought leaders of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the different churches. Get them on board. On the basis of their theological expertise, these church leaders can then decide in favor for their whole church, in favor of church unity. Now think about what Ellen White said. The, our prophet, that's what she said. She said, a new movement will come in. And if you, and if you don't be on your P's and Q's, this is what's going to happen. He says, he says, this is what the guy says, then they can work politically to sell the idea to their own people. So now get them to sell it. Don't come from the outside and try to sell it. Influence them and get them to sell it to their own people. That's the easiest way to do it because they already have confidence in their people. They can frame the doctrines and language that that particular church is familiar with. So you use the same language, but you're going to teach a different doctrine. <clears throat> you're going to alter it. Keep the new idea before the people in meetings, in publications, etc. Next, they can work with zeal among the church. Church members, making sure of the support of their members before bringing the matter to a vote. Work behind the scenes, he said. Make sure you have the votes uh, in harmony with what you want to do before you bring it. And once you have them in harmony, then you can, you can be sure of getting what you need done, done when you come to the vote. Oh, yeah. Next, he says, he taught that the Protestants had become so liberal that they are unconcerned about doctrine as long as their few familiar Christian ideas are present. What else did he teach? He says, use church authority. He said, the average congregation in the Protestant churches usually practices the kind of obedience to their church leaders that is customary in the Roman Catholic Church. That's what he says. He says, the average congregation in the Protestant churches, the evangelical question, you know, churches, usually practices the same kind of obedience to their church leaders that is customary in the Roman Catholic Church. He says, Protestant lady are passive and therefore can be expected to follow their leaders into union with Rome. Now, if you're looking crazy right now, you shouldn't be, because the spirit of prophecy outwarns us. You shouldn't, be, you shouldn't be amazed, you shouldn't be shocked, you shouldn't be like, this is a ridiculous conspiracy theory. No. Will it be written of you and I that we should listen to the prophets? You know what he says about that? Look at the bottom of what Ellen White says. She says, we cannot, we must not place blind confidence in any man. However high his profession of faith or his position in the church, we must not follow his guidance unless the word of God sustains him. Think about that. Will you listen to the prophet on that? I'm going to read that again. The prophet of the Lord says, we cannot, we must not place blind confidence in any man. However high his profession of faith, that means he might say, oh, you know, I'm more righteous than now. His profession doesn't mean anything in and of itself. 
or his position in the church. That in itself means nothing. We must not follow his guidance unless what? Unless the word of God sustains him. So guess what? Unless the word of God sustains you, our pastor, our elders, our leader, and whatever case, unless, of course, you're like Ahab and you don't believe the prophet. Now, if you're like Ahab and you say, I don't care about all of that, I'm going to do it. Well, it would be written of you as it was written of him. It would be written of me as it was written of him if we refuse to accept the words of the prophet. He goes on to say, as the new idea gains strength, it sounds amazingly similar to what the prophet told us. He goes on to say, as, he was, as this new theology he was setting up, as the new idea gains strength, an ecumenical union of churches would be formed. Individual denominations would remain, but all partner churches acknowledge the meaning and the right of the patron service of the Roman Pope to be the concrete guarantor of the unity of the church. Guarantor of the unity of the church. This is where it's going to go. Already, uh, a lot of Protestant churches are basically on the sneak tip going along with and, and allowing them to set up to be the moral, to set up the moral uh, compass. First, next he says to accelerate the process. What's this process of bringing about the ecumenical movement? And but yet allowing the churches to keep their same names, to think they're keeping the same doctrine by using the same language, but having a, a different meaning behind the scenes or behind the words. Accelerate the process by interchange between churches, i.e. pastors from different denominations, exchange pulpits, etc. Abolish doctrine as a source of controversy. No member church is allowed to reject the doctrine of another member church. And this is what he said. This is the plan of modern Catholicism, the softer, kinder, gentler Catholicism. But it's really the conspiracy between the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet, where Satan is depending on you and I to be like Ahab, to be like Ahaziah and not receive, believe the prophet, as opposed to being like Hezekiah and believe the prophet. He says, dwell chiefly upon the love doctrine. He said, this is what he says. He said, dwell upon the love doctrine. This would silence the fingering of the Vatican as the beast power. That's, that's such an unloving and unkind thing to say. Why are you saying that about them? Listen to what the prophet of the Lord says. In this day with God, page 299. There is a spurious experience prevailing now everywhere in regard to the love of Jesus. That we must dwell on the love of Jesus. That faith in Jesus is all we need. But these souls must be instructed that the love of Jesus in the heart will lead to humility of life and obedience to all his commandments. The love of Jesus that goes no farther than the lips would not save any soul but be a great delusion. So we can preach the love of Jesus in such a way that it becomes a great delusion. And yet we will be considered loving and kind. Isn't that something? Why? Because we didn't listen to the prophet. Will it be written of you? Will it be written of me? That we should have listened to the prophets. She says there is a spurious experience prevailing now. Everywhere, in regard to the love of Jesus, that we must dwell on the love of Jesus, that faith in Jesus is all we need. Just believe, brother, that's all you need to do. Just believe. But these souls must be instructed. She didn't say they ought to be. She said they must be instructed that the love of Jesus in the heart will lead to humility of life and obedience to all his commandments. The love of Jesus that goes no further than that, than the lips, rather, would not save any soul, but rather be a great delusion. Brothers and sisters, when you teach the love of Jesus, do you teach it in harmony with what's been revealed from the prophet? Or you do you teach it in harmony with what's been revealed through deceptive teachings and practices? Do you teach the love of Jesus on what you think it is or what the Lord, the prophet of the Lord say it is? Will it be written of you and will it be written of me that we should listen to the prophets? I would tell you today that God desires that it would be written of you and it would be written of me that we were faithful, that we believed his word, that we believed his representatives. Even with the apostate, I don't know if you call this, but in the story with the apostate Ahab, listen how many, the prophet told him about five to six times, that's God in his mercy telling him five or six times on the day that he was going to die. God knew he was going to die that day, and yet in his mercy he says, he told him five or six times in different ways, listen, don't go out. If you go out, you know this. If you go out, 
even at the day, on the day that he was going to die, God in his mercy, still trying to save him, told him five or six times through his prophet, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Will it be written of you and I that we died a second death because we didn't listen to the prophet? Will it be written of you and I that we died the first death because we didn't listen to the prophet? God loves us. If he didn't love us, he would not have sent his only son. If God didn't love us, he would not have taken the time to send all these prophets. 66 books in the Bible. Written over a period of about 1,500 years. We have the testimony of the scriptures. We have the testimony of the faithful during the dark ages. We have the testimony of the spirit of prophecy. God moved upon his lady to write all of this knowledge and light. The most prolific female author in American history. Will it be written of us? Do we believe the prophets? I'll leave you with this. There will be those who believe the prophets. There will be those of us who accept God. And there will be weapons thrown at us. Because there's a conspiracy between the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet. But, what did the Lord say? In demonstrating his love toward us, he says in Isaiah 54, 17, No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgments thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, says the Lord. That is the true love of Jesus. You know why? He says, because they love Jesus so much that they follow him until eventually his character became theirs. And he says, their righteousness is no longer their righteousness, my righteousness is in them. And they said, no weapon that formed against them will prosper. Every tongue that shall rise against them in judgment, shall con that thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of who? The servants of the Lord. And their righteousness is of me, says the Lord. They don't have their own righteousness like, like Ahab. They don't have their own righteousness like Ahaziah. They don't have their own righteousness. They have the righteousness of the Lord. They don't preach a false love of Jesus. They preach what the Lord revealed to them to preach through the prophet. 